We're continuing with our series called Flourish, and if you weren't here last week, you can hopefully catch up online. We'll have it up hopefully this week. And uh, it's all about this. We believe God has not called us just to survive, but he's called us to thrive. We believe that if you're alive today, there's a reason for you to be alive, and we believe we're called to flourish. It means to grow strong. Now, this is not a, a get-rich-quick sermon series. It's not about that. But we believe that God has called us to grow strong and to flourish and to make a difference. The reason why you're here, the reason why we're alive is that God has a plan for your life. And the objective of the church is to help us to discover that by knowing Jesus. We want to help you know God, to find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. That's what this is all about. The four purposes of our church, which is really wrapped up in the Bible. And it should be not only be the purposes of our church, but your purpose as well. We want to help you to do that together. And so last week we spoke about knowing God. The most important thing you can do, a lot of people know about God. They believe in God. Hey, I know I believe in God. I, I know about God. But do you really know God? Do you have conversations with God? Do you, do you, does he speak to you as you read the scripture? Do you know him? Can I really know God? Yes, you can. We talked about that last week. Well, how do we know God? We know God by following Jesus. And so that was last week. Today, we're talking about something that might be a little controversial. And so I'm not afraid to get controversial because the Bible is very clear about this issue. We're talking about finding freedom. That Christ has died to give us freedom. Not freedom to do whatever we want to, but freedom to be who he's created us to be in his image. And so a lot of people are bound and in shackles and, and trying to be what God's called them to be. For example, maybe there's a habitual sin you just can't seem to get rid of. It's been gone with you 10, 20 years, 10 months, whatever it is. There's something you can't seem to get over. Maybe there's something in your family. Maybe your father or mother was an alcoholic and, and now you're struggling with alcohol or, or drugs or addictions and you're like, what is going on? I just can't seem to get through it. I love God, but I'm struggling with it. What's going on in my life? Well, part of our objective is to, know, is to know God, is to find freedom. And so today we're going to talk about that. And, and we, we're going to talk about the spiritual realm that we all deal with. All right? So that's what's going to be happening today. So freedom from what? Being able to do what you would want to do, what you feel in your heart, what God's called you to do. Well, open your Bibles, you could, please. You've got to forgive me. I'm still getting over my little... <laughs> My little tickle in my throat here. Uh, if you open your Bibles to John chapter 8, verse 31, here's Jesus. And he's talking to a people. He's talking to the church of his day. Now, obviously, uh, the church was not, was not birthed at that point. However, he was talking to the church of his day, which would be the Jewish people that believed in him. And he's talking to them about freedom. And so let's go ahead and pick it up from here. Uh, John 8, verse 31. You can follow along on, on line I mean, on your, on your device or also on your Bible and also on the screen. Okay, here we go. John 8, 31. Then Jesus said to those who believed him. Okay, are we clear about the audience? He's speaking to people who believe him. So in many ways, he'd be speaking to us today. Hey, we believe who he is, most of us here. Okay, or those watching, I believe in Jesus. I believe, okay. He says this, if you abide in me, and the word abide does not mean, it means to dwell, it means to set up camp, it means to make your dwelling place. He who makes your dwelling place in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, gnosko, you shall know the truth. And the word gnosko there, used in the Greek, what that simply means is, it means a knowledge of participation where it is a part of what you're doing. It's not what we, what we reward people with degrees in or getting an A in a test is not knowing uh, what happened in 1492, all right, what happened about Columbus sail on the blue. It's not about that. It's about knowing something. For example, if you think about Michael Jordan, I used to love to watch him play basketball. Not only did Michael Jordan know about basketball, but he knew basketball. He changed the game of basketball, didn't he? Okay, he knew it. And the Bible says right here, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples, and you shall know the truth. The truth. And the truth will make you free. Now, if the truth sets you free, what would hold you in bondage? A lie. Exactly. 
Jesus has come with the truth. The father of lies comes to lie, kill, and destroy. Christ is the way, he's the truth, and he's the lie. So it says, you abide in my word, you're my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will, shall make you free. And they answered to him, the church said to him, hey, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anybody. Now, I don't know about you, but I found that kind of strange that they would say that. They're saying we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anybody. Where were they for 400 years? They were slaves, right? So they're getting it wrong right here. We're saying we're not in bondage to anybody. You know, one thing I have found, when you're in bondage to something, sometimes you're not even aware of it. I'm fine. I have no problems. It's just, oh, I'll, I'll get around to it next year. I'll, have, I'll get more willpower. In the new year, I'll, I'm going to stop doing that. And they're living in this fantasy world. They didn't realize it. They said, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will make us free? I heard people say, listen, I gave my life to Christ, right? I, I said the sinner's prayer. I believe in Jesus. Everything is fine now. God took, no demon can touch me. No principality can touch me. I am in Christ. Nothing can touch me. And I'm fine. I'm not in bondage to anything. I'm free. And what does Jesus say? He says this. Most assuredly, in other words, listen guys, this is the absolute truth, he's saying. I say to you, whoever commits sin is a what? Slave of sin. So when you and I choose to be angry and, and say the wrong thing, or you choose to get involved with lust or anger or, or materialism or bitterness or unforgiveness, and you start doing that, you become a slave to it, especially if you can't seem to stop it. A slave doesn't have control. A slave is mastered by somebody else. It's called the master. It's whether a slave. And if you have an area of your life that you can't seem to have victory over, in many ways, you're a slave to it. Jesus said it very, very clear. If you commit sin, you become a slave. I'm not saying make one mistake one time, but if you continue in a sin, unforgiveness, for example, materialism, pride, lust, abuse of alcohol, drugs, and other things, whatever it is, if you continue in it, you become a slave to it. Whatever you hold on to, holds on to you. Whatever you hold on to controls you. And Jesus is saying that very, very clearly here. I say to you, whoever commits a sin is a slave to sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Listen to this. Therefore, this is good news, folks. If the son makes you free. Now notice that there's a condition clause. If the son makes you free, you shall be what? Free. free indeed. So the good news is this. There are people in the church, maybe even here today, that you're struggling with certain issues. You're in bondage to certain issues. You can't seem to overcome it. The good news is Christ is enough to do it. Okay, we're going to describe to you in a few moments what it means about that. For example, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, I think a lot of people don't realize that we live in a realm. We live in a different realm. There's basically three, three areas that you and I deal with when we deal with trying to change and make a difference. The biggest problem you and I often have is by looking in the mirror and say, yes, me, all right? Uh, often you deal with your flesh. You deal with yourself, right? For many times, you and I make decisions and do things. As a result of that, we become the consequences, right? <coughs> if you choose to do something. So we have the flesh. The second thing that controls us is the world, or if you will, the world system. Make no mistake about it, by us living in the United States of America, we live in the USA culture, there's a certain Western culture, there's a church culture, we live in a culture, and a culture affects us. The Bible says, be not deceived, evil company corrupts. We are affected by our environment, and if you're not aware of the fact, the people you hang out with, the people you associate with, will have an effect upon you, especially if you're not aware of it. We associate. Who you associate with has an effect upon you. That's why you be very careful who you associate with. So you have the world system. You have, you have your flesh. You have the world system. And then you have something else called the spiritual realm. Yes, there is a spiritual realm right here, right now, simultaneously surrounding us. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. The Bible makes it very, very clear in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. 
See, Apostle Paul talking about, he says this, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood alone, he's basically meaning, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Let me just break it down for a few moments here. When he says against principalities, ever hear municipalities? You the municipality of Cheshire or Prospect or Hamden or Middlebury, wherever you live, there's the different municipalities. There are different geographical governing systems. And in the Bible, if you look at the book of Daniel and other places, and there is an indication that there are spiritual territories in different areas. Let me make something very clear to you. The devil, people often think that the devil's chasing them. I personally don't believe that. I believe there is a devil, but he's not omnipresent. In other words, he can't be all places at all times. But there is a devil, okay? He's like the commander-in-chief. And we'll get into it in a few moments. He doesn't have a little red jumpsuit and a little pitchfork and laugh. The devil is a real created being. And uh, what happened was this. He rebelled against God. And the Bible says that a third of the angels were struck down. He was called the son of the morning star. And so he was thrown out of heaven with a third of the angels. Now, there's some good news here. If a third of the angels were left, how many angels are left? Two-thirds. So for every demon, there's at least two. So we got the victory already. All right, so the Bible says, we do not wrestle against blood, flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts, of wickedness in the heavenly places. He's describing, I don't have time today to tell you all this, I could break it all down and talk about the different realms of spiritual opposition that you and I face from the kingdom of darkness. It is out there, my friends, it is there. All you have to do is look at the news and see the junk that's going on. The evil that perpetrates society. And people say, well, that's kind of, you know, that's, that's, that's the dark ages. We don't believe that anymore. We, we, the people associate bad choices with, uh, with evil, but we don't believe in that. The Bible talks a lot about demons. I think 60% of Jesus' ministry were dealing with demonic strongholds. Do you realize that? And so for not to talk about demons would be like cutting out much of the New Testament. We're not supposed to do that. So there is a realm of that. There, there's yourself, there's a the flesh, there's the world, and there's a the spiritual realm, both good and bad, enemy and demons. And so the good news, 61 times Jesus is dealing with demons in the New Testament. 61 times. So there's a reality of angels and demons. I like what C.S. Lewis says. He says the following. There's two, there's two things that the enemy loves to do to people. One thing is this, they make you superstitious. And these are the people that believe there's a demon behind every bush, right? The people, oh, there's a demon in my pizza. I mean, everything's a demon, <laughs> right? Everything's a demon. Every problem, oh, the devil's after me. What's going on, oh, the devil? I mean, how are you doing? I don't want to hear, I ask him, how's your Thanksgiving? Well, the devil, I don't want to ask him about the devil, okay? Maybe I had, I had devil eggs, but that's all I had. Tell me what's going on in your life. And everything's the devil. You hear people like that? I mean, everything's the devil. I've been to prayer meetings where I've been trying to pray, and they're praying about the devil. I'm like, are we praying to the devil or are we praying to God? It's all the devil this, the devil that, the devil this. And, and I have found sometimes people that are really involved with deliverance ministries, they're extreme, or really get themselves um, unbalanced and in a bad place. Okay, that's not good. So to become superstitious where everything is the devil, that's an extreme. Another extreme would be, ah, we don't have to worry about the devil. He's, Jesus conquered on the cross. Just live your life. It's fine. There is no more devil. You're fine. No, that's not good either. And the enemy is happy with either one. He's happy with people that ignore him and people that have a preoccupation with him. You see, not to understand what's going on would be like being at war and having no intelligence and no surveillance. Intelligence and surveillance is very, very important, as we found out from the Iraq war. Our intelligence was not correct, was it? what we thought. And so they can get yourself into trouble. But if you have no intelligence and no surveillance, you're, you're walking and living without a full picture of how to confront the enemy. Now, I do believe very strongly that we are in the physical realm. Our primary function and power and authority is in the physical realm. But we still have power in the heavenly places as well. But we need to be in concert with God about that. 
And so I, I people always saying these various things. Now, I, if, if you're the person that says, praise God, pastor's finally talking about demons. If that's you, you're probably out of balance. <laughs> or if you're going, oh, no, he's talking about demons. I thought this church was okay. Oh, no, poltergeist, Linda Blair, sp head spinning. Oh, this is going to be bad. No, we're not about that, okay? We're not going to get weird and, and get crazy. Hollywood makes it, dramatizes it, makes it a lot different than it is. The truth is that there are demons and there are angels. Gehazi, who was Elijah's servant, was really afraid because the enemy was encamping upon them because Elijah knew the secrets of the enemy. And so they sent an army to get him. And he's like, oh my gosh, all those people. And Elijah goes, God opened his eyes. And all of a sudden, Gehazi's eyes opened and he saw legions of, of angels. This is more of us than it is with them. My friends, I believe this. If we, if we could hand out special glasses, like the 3D movies, like Peanuts 3D, which I really recommend. Anyhow, so if you, you put these glasses on, imagine you can see the spiritual realm. Right now, there'd be angels and demons all around here. I believe that. But God is stronger. Okay? You don't have to be afraid because Jesus is greater than any other name there is. He's the strongest name. He's the strongest name. And when he threw out Satan, he felt like lightning right away. He's stronger. They're not two opposite yin and yang. No, we're not talking about the yin and yang. God is a lot more powerful. Everything Satan does, he has to have permission or he cannot do it. And by the way, we're going to have a series on freedom in January, the first week of January, four weeks. We're also going to have 21 days of fasting and prayer, prayer meeting every day at 6 and, and also on Saturday at 9. We're going to really go after this to really break free for 2016. So this is going to be part of what we're going to talk about freedom. It's part of the purposes of our church to find freedom. I like what Dr. Jack Hayford says about this whole thing, one of my favorite pastors that ever was. And this is what he says. He says, you can't cast out the flesh, nor can you disciple a demon. <laughs> you can't cast out the flesh, because sometimes it's just a flesh, nor can you disciple a demon. There are people that are demon-controlled or demon-influenced. You say, yeah, I know, I'm married to one. Now, come on. <laughs> Even animals can be demon-possessed. Okay, I'm not going to mention cats. All right. Can a Christian be demon possessed? There's a problem with that question. The, qu the problem is this when they translated the Greek to King James, they used the word possessed. And it's not a really good word because the word possessed would, would, would suggest that the demon has complete control over the person, like they had the deed and the title of your house. Actually, the real word for that would be more like demonized. Like, a, like for example, there's a pest in your house. And uh, it'd be domini somai, if I pronounce it correctly, which basically means demon possessed, but it does not mean the possessed that we think of, where it's like the movies in Hollywood. It's not that this enemy has complete control of that. Because once you give your life to Jesus, you are the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? He, he has ownership of the house, but you can let stuff in. You can let, for example, right now, if you guys left here today and went to church, which you are, congratulations, and you left your doors unlocked at home and a thief walked into the house, does the thief own the house? No, he's, in, he's infesting the house. He or she, don't want to be sexist. Is infesting the house, right? And, and that's what can happen. For another example is this. Imagine this. Imagine you decide that you're going to leave your doors open. And it's, you know, it's a nice 61 degrees, and you have a, the trash from your Thanksgiving meal there, and all of a sudden the mice are outside, and the mice come into your house, and they find a way in your wall. They start laying. They don't lay eggs. They start having babies. I'm sorry. <laughs> they don't lay eggs. <laughs> you ever have mouse eggs? They're delicious. Um, I don't know where I got that from. Sorry. But... <laughs> <laughs> that was really dumb. Okay. <laughs> but seriously, the, the mice will multiply. You can have roaches, fly, rodents. Now, do they own the house? No, you own the house. You're the deed of the house. But they can infest your house and be a pest and cause problems upon your house. The same thing with demonic strongholds. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, do not be angry 
in sin, lest you give the what? The devil a foothold. In other words, you give him a beachhead. You give him a place to invade your life. When you and I don't forgive, Jesus says if you don't forgive, God won't forgive you. And then he gives an illustration about the rich man, uh, that, I mean the man that owed so much money. He said, hand him over to the torturers until he pays every last dime. So my father will do for you if you don't forgive your brother from your heart. So we choose not to forgive somebody. What we're doing, we're opening the door and saying, hey, enemy, come on in. Hey, Satan's kingdom, come on in. We're inviting stuff in our lives. You may still own the house, but you're infested and demonized, if you will, by stuff. And I believe that. I believe that can happen to us, and I've seen it happen. There's been things in my own life that I have been free of, which I'm going to share in January. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to bait you for the series in January here. But people often say that they say, well, a demon, a Christian cannot be demon-possessed. And I would agree with you in that, in that context that cannot be mastered. For example, in Luke 21, 19, it uses the same word, demonized somai, which means, it says this, possess your souls, where uh, Jesus is talking about the last days. Hey, be in control of your souls during this time. And so when the word possess here in the Greek simply means in control of what's going on. Let me ask you another question. Can you be under, in the, under the influence? Some of you are saying, some of you had too much influence this past holiday weekend. But if, for example, if I start drinking alcohol and too much of it, I'll be under the influence. Now, does the alcohol control me? No. But I'm under the influence. I don't drink, by the way, okay? Let me make that clear. But if I, if I drink too much alcohol, I'll be under the influence of that alcohol, and I'll make poor choices. My senses will be off. I won't be able to walk in a straight line. My motor skills will be compromised. And have you noticed that people often drunk don't think they are? That's why they get in the car and drive, right? Well, many people are, don't realize it, but they're demonized to a certain level, to a certain degree. They're not even aware of it. And it's controlling their relationships, and they find themselves in bondage to various things. I'm just telling you. So a Christian cannot be owned, but it can be demonized. Well, how do we find freedom from this? How do we find freedom? If you find yourself where you just can't, you've tried everything. You've tried self-help, you've tried this, you've tried the other, and you just can't seem to break the cycle of addiction maybe in your life, maybe it's a drug addiction, maybe it's a lust issue, maybe it's I mean, unforgiveness. I don't know, maybe it's all sorts of issues and you just can't seem to break it. Could it be? There's demonic stronghold. Remember, it's, there's the world, there's yourself, and there's a demonic realm. It's like a mixture, it's like a recipe. And sometimes it's a lot and sometimes it's a little. But my friends, I'm very, I'm very sure the enemy's not happy about me telling you about this because some of you are going to find some freedom you've never found before. This is very, very important. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood alone. There is spiritual principalities out there. We need to be aware of it, and we need how to fight it. Well, how do I fight it? How do we find freedom? If you're taking notes, this is how you find freedom. You find freedom through connecting to Jesus. Oh, how obvious is that? Well, I know it's obvious, but sometimes the most obvious things are the things we struggle with the most. We need to connect to Jesus. That's the only way you're going to overcome demonic stronghold because only the name of Jesus has the power to thwart the enemy. The Bible says in John 15, 4 through 5, Jesus says this, Remain in me, and I will remain in you. Look, there is a responsibility on our part. He says, remain in me and I will remain in you. All through the Bible, God does one thing. We have to join him in it. Um, Noah makes an ark. God sends the flood. We see it over and over and over. There's a partnership. We got to do our part and God will meet us. But we have to participate. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit or it is severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. <clears throat> yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. He's talking to plural, not just one person. He's talking to the branches. What are the branches? The church. He's the vine. We're the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. You're not going to get free of demonic bondage without being connected to Jesus Christ and committed to Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, it is impossible. But the name of Jesus is more powerful and stronger. The Bible says... In Romans, 
no things high, no things low, no the past, no principalities will be able to separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus. So the name of Jesus is stronger than any other name. You see, the Philippians says, in Philippians 2 says this, Therefore, 2.9, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, including the enemy. That in the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in, listen to this, of those in heaven, and those in heaven, he's talking about the heavenly realms, all right? And those on earth, which is the, the playing field we're in, and those under the earth, which he's talking about the dead, he's talking about the demonic strongholds, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of the Father. You see, so Jesus is the strong heart. So we need to be connected to Jesus. To find freedom, you have to give your life to Jesus Christ or it's not going to work. And if you are a believer in Christ, you have to stay connected to him. One of the most important things that I can do and one of my major goals in pastoring this church and helping you is I want to see you all become self-sufficient Christians where you can feed yourself every day. You know how to open the Bible. You know how to read it. You know how to receive from God. You know how to pray. You know how to have fellowship with each other. And you know how to make a difference in the world. My friends, that's the goal. That's the goal. And so every day, it's so important to get into the Word. Some of you can't function without having a meal. You start shaking, you start having all kinds of trouble. Well, I would say to you that it's even more important that we stay in God and stay strong in Jesus Christ by remaining in His Word, by listening to His Word, by being in fellowship. It gives you the power and the strength. We're going to be sharing more about this in January. Did I mention the fact that we're having a series in January about freedom? Okay, I just want to make sure. I... <laughs> okay, now, I want you to turn now to your Bible to Luke chapter 10, uh, verse 17. Now, Jesus had his 72 disciples that he sent out, and he sent them to go do what he did, town to town to town to town. And they came back, and they were all excited because Jesus gave them authority. Well, let's go ahead and read it and pick it up in verse 17. When the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us. When we use your name, they're excited about that. Wow, we never heard of such a thing before. And they never heard of such a thing before because it didn't happen before. Yes, he told them, listen to this, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. In other words, when Satan came against God, it wasn't like there was a big battle. He said, get out of here. Boom, he fell like lightning. He kicked them out immediately. The two, one third of the angels kicked out. Listen to this, verse 19. Look. I have given you authority. He's talking to his church. He's talking to us. I have given you authority. Now, how do you have that authority? Through what? Through the name of Jesus, through the uh, participation of Jesus. Now, there were people in the book of Acts that were using the name of Jesus, but they had no relationship. And this is what they said this. We know Paul. We know Jesus, but we don't know who you are. And they beat him to a pulp. So we're not just talking about using the name as an abracadabra, as a contention. We're talking about a relationship, abiding in a relationship with Jesus Christ. So, verse 18. Yes, he told them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you authority, cornerstone, over all the power of the enemy. Now, I just threw the cornerstone in there. Don't, I'm not a heretic. I'm just asking, putting you in there, okay? And you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. He's not talking about snakes, scorpions. He's talking about demonic. Those represent demons and different types of demons. He said, I've given you the power to trample on them. You don't have to be fearful, folks. If you're on Jesus, you have, you're on the winning side and you have the power to overcome the enemy. All right? You do not need to fear if you are in Christ because Christ is a bazooka to the devil's water pistol. There's no competition. Well, why is there so much trouble in the world? Because we give it to him. Listen to this. Look, I have given you authority. You walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Not just beat them up, but I'm talking about crush them. Nothing will injure you, but don't rejoice because the evil spirits obey you, but rejoice that your names are registered in heaven. 
You see that? I mean, as much as we like to have these power encounters, it's more important that our relationship with Christ is fostered and that we know who we are in heavenly places. We know our identity. Don't get hung up thinking about the devil. You go the way that God tells you to go, and when he comes, you can deal with him. If, if I were to release you today, say, so I'm going to find criminals, and you went out like a vigilante, and you're going to look around. First of all, you don't have your uniform, you're not a cop, and you're looking for trouble. I'm going to find someone doing a crime and catch them. You're going to get yourself into trouble. You'll get yourself hurt, and you'll be arrested because you don't have the authority to do that. So many people run around looking for demons. That's not what we're called to do. John Paul Jackson, who's now with the Lord, wrote a book called Needless Casualties of War, where he spoke about people getting crazy with the stuff. You follow Jesus. He's your lead. You stay in the platoon. You stay in the regiment. You follow the commander-in-chief. And then when he comes, you can deal with him. But don't lead the regiment. Don't lead the pack of people marching. I'm going on my own. I'm going to find them myself. Don't do that. That will lead to problems. Stay in Christ. He's greater than the enemy. And so, and we have to remember that. So look what Jesus also has to say in verse 21. At the same time, Jesus was filled with joy. He said, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever. There are people today that say, that's silly, demons. We're wise and we're clever. That's just superstitious mumbo jumbo. And then Jesus says, I thank you for hiding from people like that and showing it to, what does he say? Revealing them to the childlike faith. Yes, Father, it pleases you to do this way. There are people today who will mock what I'm saying and say, this is crazy, this is crazy stuff. No, my friends, there is evil. Come on, can you not see the stuff? Someone going into an abortion clinic and shooting people up, people lopping heads off in the Middle East, the evil perpetrated, you think there's no such thing as evil? Oh, there's evil. So the first thing we do is connect to Jesus. That's okay, you, you get that? It's through the power in the name of Jesus. And the second thing we got to do is this. If you're taking notes, find freedom by connecting to Jesus' body called the church. We have to be connected, folks. We're not called just to be in Jesus. That's all I need. He didn't plan for us to be just him and you. He said, I am the vine. You are the branches, plural. You're not supposed to be all by yourself. We're called to win together. So, before God does something great, he will connect you to other people. We don't just need parts. We need to be connected together. In fact, um, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12, two are better than one because they have good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is all alone and he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Some of you have absolutely no one you can talk to if you fall. Well, come on, don't be so negative. How can you say I'm falling? That's, that's negative. Okay, I'm positive that you will fall. All of us will eventually fall. I'm not giving you a license to fall, but we're going to make mistakes. Who do you have to help you when you fall? Who are you going to happen when a situation happens in your life where you've blown it, you made a mistake, or you're going through a difficult time? Who's going to help you with that? Do you realize this? Even Jesus was involved with a small group. Now listen, I'm not just trying to perpetrate, oh, he's trying to promote small groups in Cornerstone. Small groups at Cornerstone are only a catalyst to help foster relationships. Some of you in this church became friends, are now friends for over a decade because you met each other in a small group. And now you're part of each other's lives. Small groups are nothing but a mechanism and an opportunity for you to get connected to other people. We're not called to live this by our life. Even Jesus had a small group of 12. Did he need them? Not really, but he has still had them, didn't he? Well, actually, he didn't need them because he couldn't have left the earth without them. Jesus said, okay, you guys are in charge. You 12, you got it. Go ahead, go. There's about 500 of them, I guess, all together. Go, and then 120 were left at the, at the Pentecost day. He says, you got it, got it now. When Jesus was going through his despair in the Garden of Gethsemane, did he go by himself? No. Who did he ask to come with him? James, Peter, and John. He says, pray with me, for I am at the point of sorrow to death, he says. 
come and pray with me. If Jesus needed a small group, who do you think you are that you can just do this thing all by yourself? I know it sounds manly or womanly. I don't know if it sounds womanly or not, but it sounds, it sounds like I'm, I'm strong. I don't need anybody. Well, we're not created. Do you realize that God has purposely left things out of your life and my life on purpose? That you have some things that I need and, you, and I have some things you need. If we all work together, instead of competing, we complete each other. It's like taking the pixels right up there. You see those things. There's a bunch of little lights. And you look at one, it's nothing. But you pull back, you begin to see an image. It's my prayer, my hope, that when people pull back from Cornerstone Church, they don't just see you and I, they see Jesus. They see the body of Christ. That each part, each joint supplies, that we have different parts working together, not competing, but completing each other. So Jesus did that. Now, it says in Ephesians 3.10, I'm just going to show you this about the church. It says, the intent now, the manifold wisdom of God, might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. In other words, the manifold is like a manifold on a car. It distributes all the fuel to different cylinders. So the manifold wisdom of God is being distributed to the cylinders in the different parts of the church. Look what it says here. The manifold wisdom of God might be known by the church to what? To the what? Principalities. He's not talking about, he's talking about the spiritual realm principalities, and powers in the heavenly places. Well, how do we fight the enemy by the church? Be connected to the head and be connected to the body. Listen, I know this sounds a little sacrilegious, and please don't misunderstand me, but I'm, I'm, I'm setting a point based upon the, the logic of the scripture. If Christ is the head and we are the body, the two work together. What happens if you lop off the head from the body? Doesn't work, friends. Jesus is all I need. Yeah, Jesus is, has purposely, he's designed us to need the body. It isn't just the head. It's the head and the body. Now, the body has to be in subjection to the head. But you cannot win this thing by yourself. We are called to be the body of Christ. This is how we get free. Partially how we get free. Jesus says this. The manifold wisdom. And then I want to read to you once again Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 to 20. I want to show you the togetherness here, okay? I want you to follow along with me, please. See then, you walk circumspectly, but carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. How people say, I want to know what God's will is. Well, right here, he says, do you want to know what the word, the word of the will, the God's will is? Here it is. Do not be drunk with wine which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. You need to have the Holy Spirit to fill us, which is another topic as well. Speaking to yourself. Is that what it says? Speaking to who? Come on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the God, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's another part. Submitting to who? I just submit to Jesus. No, submitting to one another. There's mutual submission to each other. There are times where your mission has to sub someone else's mission. How do we do that? That's when the body becomes the body. It's not about competition. It's about completion. And the days are evil, my friends. As we're walking in these evil days, and I believe we're in the last of the last days, we're going to need the body to work together. So you've got to get used to each other. All right? It's time to lay aside competition and get involved with completion. It's time to stop being alone. Look what it says in James 5, 16. Here's another one another. I'm gonna ask if, uh, you make your way up, please, Esteban. James 5, 16. Confess your sins to God alone. Is that what it says? Confess your sins to who? Each other. And pray for yourself. What does it say? Each other, so that you may be healed. Listen, some of you are living in a secret all by yourself. You come to church, you look like you're great, your, your spouse is happy, your kids are well-behaved, but you have a secret that no one else knows about. 
Maybe you're drinking on the side and getting drunk or doing drugs. Maybe you're lusting. Maybe you're looking at things you shouldn't be looking at. Maybe you're involved with relationships you shouldn't be involved with. Maybe you're involved with illegal activity and making money. No one knows about it, and you're ashamed. If I told anyone, I'm done. We should not be living ourselves like that. How do we get free? We get free by being connected to Jesus and his body. There are people that have helped me get free. There's been people that have come to me that my friends have said, hey, you're not good, in, you're not right in this area. And they'll point something out to me. I didn't like it, but I knew their heart was for me. And because of them pointing that out, a stronghold was broken in my life. You'll find out in January. <laughs> John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I've loved you that you also love one another. By this, the world will know you're my disciples. Now listen to this. Here's something that will show you how to get free, my friends. Get connected to Jesus. Get connected to each other. 1 John 1, 6 says this. I know there's a lot of scripture. I, I happen to believe the Bible's real and strong and powerful. And when I read the Bible, it doesn't return to me void or you void. So when I do release the words of Christ, there's right now the power being released and freedom given to your spirits because I'm speaking the words of Jesus. If we say, 1 John 1, 6, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Some of you are walking in darkness. You're trying to have it both ways. I got Jesus on Sunday, but during the week, I'm gonna do whatever I have to do in the business. I gotta make money. I know it's not right. I'm being involved with this situation. We say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness. We lie and do not practice the truth. What's the opposite of truth? Who's the father of lies? Exactly. But, 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 I love when it says but in scripture. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have what? With who? I can't hear you. What would you say? I got... Too much rock and roll growing up. What did you say? One another. Do you see that? It's not just you and Jesus. You're not just a John Wayne Christian. Some of you like, who's John Wayne? Well, that's another time. <laughs> but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. My friends, if you want to get free, if you want to find freedom, if you got things in your life that you just can't get over, you tried everything, it could very well be there is demonic bondage in your life. The good news is you can be free. The good news is God is stronger. That Jesus in Jesus' name can cast out any spirit, but you have to be willing to cooperate with God. You have to be willing to say, I'm going to do what Jesus says. And you might need, and you could use the body of Christ to come pray for you, to help you walk it out. We're not called to walk us by ourselves. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Listen to this, same, same chapter, a couple verses up. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess... Say, so yes, I've made a mistake. I'm wrong. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from some, no, all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and the truth is not in us. Some of you are deceived. We say we have no sin. There's sin in your life. Some of you are in bondage of various things. Listen, I have some areas. We all have areas you need to work on. Some of it's just the flesh. Some of it's the world system. Some of it's the enemy. The enemy will come and he'll look for that foothold. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, do not give the devil a foothold by being angry, right? Some of us have let the enemy have, have basically, he's in our house. He's a pest. He's involved with our marriages. He's involved with our children. He's involved with our, our relationship with other people. And you find yourself having a hard time. You're under the influence. And as a result, you can't walk straight. You can't seem to get your relationship great. You can't seem to get your money right. No matter what you do, you lose money. What's going on? Could it be you're not surrendered to him financially? See, all these things begin to happen. We have to lay it down to him. So I'm going to just pray right now. 
The most important thing, if you want to get free, you have to be connected to Jesus. There's no other freedom, no other name by which a man or a woman may be saved. And the word saved in so-so, which means defreed, delivered, healed, all that, but by Jesus Christ. And so, have you given your life to Christ? Do you just believe in Christ, or have you given your life to Christ? I want to give you an opportunity, even for those watching, to give your life to Jesus Christ right now. I'm going to ask it out of respect for everyone else. Everyone just be quiet here for a moment. I'm not too much rustling. The band can play quietly. But I want to ask you today, have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Have you said, it's not my life anymore. I give my life to Jesus. The Bible says that you must confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. And so what I want to do right now, I want to pray a prayer with you this morning. And if you'll pray this prayer from your heart, it's not the words, it's the heart connected to the words. You can begin a new day of freedom in Christ Jesus. So just pray with me in your own heart. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. Lord, I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of all of my sins, the ones I know about and the ones I do not know about. I thank you. You said in the scripture, if I confess my sins, you're faithful and just to forgive me my sins. I just confess my sins. I ask you to cleanse me from all wickedness and evil. I break the power of the enemy in my life, for I declare that my life is no longer my own, my life is Jesus Christ. I hand over the keys to my life to you right now in Jesus' name. Thank you that I am now a child of God. With every head bowed, just real quickly. Can I just see a quick show of hands? You say, Pastor, I just prayed that prayer. Anyone this morning? Just real quick. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. There's a little card in your bulletin. It's called a connection card. And on it in the back it says, I've recommitted my life to Christ or I've accepted Christ for the first time. So you check that box. Okay? And hand that card into, um, if you'd like to hand it to the, one of those boxes or one of the prayer team that's up front. Let's start a new day in Christ. Now I want to pray for the rest of everyone else. If you could all stand, please. I'm going to ask the prayer team to make their way down. Some of you are believers. You believe in Christ, but man, you've got stuff going on. You just feel like you can't get free of some stuff. Now, I don't know if we're going to be able to deal with everything right now on a Sunday morning, but I believe we can have a, have a, have a start this morning. And so I want, to I want you to think about those bondages right now in your life. Let's begin to pray right now. I'm going to pray for you. Lord, in the matchless and powerful name of Jesus, Father, I break the power of sin and death over this congregation of those watching right now. We thank you that greater is he that's within us than the he that's in the world. Father, we thank you that we confess our sins. You're faithful and just to forgive us our sins. I pray for any bondages right now that are upon anyone else that we ask to break it in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to pray with me quietly or in your own voice right now. You want to follow along with this prayer. I believe you'll be, I want you to think of those things right now that are catching you up. Maybe it's an alcohol addiction. Maybe it's a drug addiction. Maybe it's an anger addiction. I don't know what it is. Food addiction, whatever it is. I want you to repeat after me in your own voice. Lord Jesus, I thank you that your name is greater than any sin and any problem. I declare that you are Lord of my life. I confess that I have allowed this or these areas. We just can tell the Lord right now what those areas are. Maybe it's lust, maybe it's pride, I don't know what it is. It's okay. Lord, I confess these areas to you right now. I hand them over to you. Holy Spirit, come and fill the place of this sin that I have had. And I choose by your grace to walk in freedom in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, that's only a start. I'm going to ask the prayer team to pray if you're going to have a, a closing song. It's called Freedom. Esteban's going to lead us in that song. And as we do that, we want to open the, uh, the front here, which is called the altar area, for prayer. Okay, then after that, we're going to dismiss you. If you want more prayer, we're going to leave it open as long as you'd like. Listen, we're all in this together, folks. We're all on the path together. Let's win this thing together. Amen? All right.
of mercy and grace falling on every face there is freedom oh, freedom reigns in this place showers of mercy Amen. God bless you. Walk in the freedom of Jesus Christ. Let's walk together as an army. Let's walk together as a family. Let's walk together in grace and peace in Jesus' name. If you need prayer, we want to open these altars for you. Otherwise, we dismiss you. God bless you.